When it comes to directorial style, no other director has been so idiosyncratically consistent as Yasujiro Ozu. A career resulting in over 50 films told the story of a filmmaker whose approach eschewed traditional film grammar to experiment with a new filmic lexicon that will become uniquely his. It doesn't take the average viewer long to identify an Ozu film, and this is down to both his artistic innovation and the absence of any deviation from his techniques. His filmography will consist of similar locales and similar themes, but all of them exhibited through that recognisable Ozuian style. Yasujiro Ozu made films within the Gandai Geki genre and focused on the ever-changing contemporary Japanese lifestyle. His main focus were relationships. More specifically, he wanted to go against the grain of what traditional family culture meant in Japan. His themes and plots were very basic, stories of generational conflicts, the dissolution of a family, and so on. Many of Ozu's films are alike and quite uneventful, but Ozu wanted to capture the cinematic quality of everyday life, and doing so required a very specific style. Instead of expanding and experimenting with different cinematic techniques, Ozu gradually eliminated them from his vocabulary. He compressed his elements, but once he found his style, he stuck with it. The result was a radiantly calm tone to his films. He made cinematic daydreams. Some may feel he was obstinate in maintaining a style for such a long time, which I think is a fair criticism. But the reason that he's important as a director is because this style wasn't something that was developed through a miscomprehension of the principles of cinema. The works of Ozu are meticulous in their planning, from the placement of individual objects to the precision of his editing. This accumulated into a filmmaker that discovered that meaning could be found in every facet of his films. And although his plots were muted, the pride Ozu took in his methodology moulded him into the influential artist he is today. He wanted to find a way wherein the film's aesthetic could explain the film more than its actual narration. Editing, composition and cinematography were how Ozu told his stories and did so diligently. Because not every frame of a movie requires meaning, unless of course, you just happen to be Yasujiro Ozu. <laughs> The first thing you're likely to notice with Ozu films is a visual style much more prominent than his contemporaries. There's an almost obsessiveness on the emphasis of image organisation. Composition takes centre stage in an Ozu film, with every shot displayed more like a painting than a film. There's an exact order with subject placements that geometricises his scenes. Straight lines and partitions dissect the image, creating spatial divides. Subjects are arranged into shapes to give the image a structure and whether the image is sparse or full, the results are typically incredible. And all of this takes place in front of a static direct camera. Ozu hardly ever moved his camera, because a moving camera deteriorates composition. Altering perspectives transforms an image's shapes, and so Ozu never once panned and would only move the camera a handful of times. And when he did, the movement was geometrically reflective of the scene. Tracking was one of the few permitted camera movements, and as we see, it's not as though the camera has a liberated sense of motion, it's as though it's almost attached to the actors. The only other times Ozu would move a camera is to demonstrate some kind of compositional similarity with the surroundings. In this scene from What Did The Lady Forget, Ozu demonstrates one of his few camera movements that didn't involve a human subject, yet still has his distinct geometric feel. So why all the restraint? Well, before we understand this, we must first understand what Ozu was trying to say. When once asked to look through a wide-angle lens by a cinematographer, Ozu simply replied, not as good as the 50. What he was referring to was the 50mm lens which Ozu used consistently in every single one of his films. Now, if you aren't as familiar with cinematography, a 50mm lens is a normal view, as it's the lens that's closest to our natural sight. This was just one way that Ozu would cinematize real life. Another way this was accomplished could be seen through Ozu's framing. Something noticeable with Ozu films is that his actors are almost locked within the composition of the frame. There's a heavy emphasis on how the image is presented, and frames within frames are ubiquitous throughout Ozu's filmography. In compositional terms, it's a technique used to focus the image by fixating on a subject. 
But if you can't find a doorway to create it, you can use furniture, nature, or even other people. So why did Ozu want to emphasize the frames of the image? Well, it's because with Ozu, nothing happens beyond the image's borders. His character's existence is completely circumscribed solely by what it is we see. He wasn't concerned with what isn't seen, and instead put all his attention on how to present what is seen. His methodical framing and placement is a testament to this. Every relevant subject must be in view. Ozu's method was that the only thing that's true is whatever's filmed, and this is why in all his films, nothing happens off camera. What we're beginning to see is a filmmaker whose system centered on how his techniques would be presented. We see this in what is possibly Ozu's most prevalent technique, the incredibly low placed camera, with almost every interior scene having the camera placed only inches from the ground. This technique is known as the tatami shot, as it replicates the eye level of someone sitting on a tatami mat. So we have a camera position at traditional eye level with a lens that almost mimics the human eye. The tatami shot feels very direct, as it requires the action to be viewed straight on, whereas most cinema usually shoots on an angle. The camera placement was also often very far away. Ozu used long diagonals to emphasize depth, and would often place other objects in the foreground to add another layer to the image. So I think it's safe in saying that the tatami shot would be described as static and distant, which are two words that you typically associate with audience detachment in cinema. But with Ozu, the culmination of all these techniques results in quite the opposite. The choice of lens, the low direct camera, the geometric compositions are all about the manner of how these films were presented. And it points to a style that's conscious, that's self-aware is presenting material to an audience. What Ozu did was develop a form that was both pervasive and that its techniques were so salient that they couldn't not be noticed, and suppressive in that these techniques subtly convey what the filmmaker wanted to accomplish. Techniques that may seem forced at first glance begins to weave their way into the texture of his films. If I had to describe what Ozu's style was, I would say that it's a blurring of what's subjective and what's objective. The end effects are films that remind the viewer that this is cinema. And so when Ozu is referenced as making contemplative cinema, it's not just because characters pontificate about life, it's because the audience can assimilate themselves to see how it's reflective of their own experiences. And it all stems from Ozu straddling the line of objectivity and subjectivity. A good example. Notice in Ozu's filmography, you will almost never see a POV shot, something that's arguably the most subjective shot in cinema. But he doesn't rule out the need for them. Take this shot from Floating Weeds. It's a manipulation of the traditional POV. It's not completely subjective, yet Ozu doesn't shy away from revealing to us the perspectives of individuals. It's the same reason his films don't feature a sole protagonist. Instead, he bounces around to every person's story. But interestingly enough, the closest that we get to a POV comes in Ozu's second most noticeable technique. Instead of framing dialogue scenes in the traditional over-the-shoulder method, Ozu framed his dialogue scenes like this. The manner in which his dialogue was shot would lend you to believe that his characters are in competition with one another as opposed to being in harmony. The constant switching means that the 180 degree rule is broken repeatedly. But this is just the grammar of Ozu. We can see that this camera procedure was never completely constant. Sometimes his characters would stare directly into the lens, but other times they would look away. And there are even instances where the eye lines of both characters don't line up. These shots aren't POVs. They're simply another example of Ozu's method of presenting anything that happens within the borders of the image. But this technique adds a layer of intimacy with the subject, as framing them in this manner leads their dialogue to a much more confessional state. It's very difficult to get uh, such uh, transparent characterizations. After watching a uh, few films of Ozu, uh, you get the feeling that uh, this father I know, this daughter I know, this school teacher I know, and each and every the behavior, you know, you does not, do not uh, ascribe it to that particular person, then you ascribe it to the whole the society which has groomed these characters. 
Many of Ozu's tonal characteristics can be summed up in the phrase mono no aware, a process that explains the sadness felt about the reality of life, and it explains the subtle melancholy that emanates in Ozu's work. So how can this be translated in editing? We've seen how Ozu tackles space, but what about time? The lack of temporal unity in Ozu's films may have been his biggest innovation. Ozu was at the forefront of his use of elliptical editing, which is simply a choice to not depict certain events in a narrative. In Tokyo Story, the parents' arrival at the children's home has them mention a previous stop that we have no idea of. And as the story progresses, the mother's sickness arrives and develops without any warning. Ozu liked to completely omit major plot points from stories. For instance, in late spring, the most important plot revolves around the daughter's wedding, something that we skip right past. This highlights Ozu's method of only including what's important on screen. Many of his films require some spectator inference, as we can only assume what occurs off screen, and so the audience's opinion is ever changing. And by using ellipses in editing, it stresses the passage of time. It leaves a transient tone over his films, as it gives the impression that all our experiences have an impermanence to them, and Ozu treats these experiences as such. The rules amongst Ozu's editing was not too dissimilar to how he would compose his images. We still have to see everything. And so when cutting individual scenes, Ozu would make sure that no character action is missed. During conversations, Ozu would capture one character speaking, then cut, and capture the other character speaking. And if a character was about to move in the scene, we would see another cut, so they could once again be locked within the frame. Ozu edits at the end of one character action to capture the following action in its entirety, even if this means that we cut from room to room to watch someone leave the scene. You may think that this simple cutting couldn't really offer much, however Ozu's flair for editing is seen at the beginnings and endings of scenes. With the detachment of unity across various scenes, Ozu's transitions managed to become one of his standout elements. He would shoot the natural landscape or small portions of objects lying around, and unlike what we're accustomed to, his transitions lasted for many shots. But when it comes to its editing, Ozu ensured that the calm pace of the film must be reflected here. In Ozu's transitions, there's equivalence in the timings of his cuts. No shot lasts longer than another, and what this does is it gives equal importance to every image we see. Things feel as though they're shot with a certain reverence, and furthers that idea of impermanence. It feels as though this may be the last time we ever see this object. Holding out on editing gives time to build emotion with a shot, but cutting can interrupt this. And instead of shooting where our character was going to be, Ozu would rarely shoot directly at the location. He would shoot the area adjacent to where our character would be and link the shots with some kind of object. This creates a very small but tangible world that the characters inhabit and heightens the space that they live in. These spaces are treated with such importance that Ozu never edited them out of the picture. Empty rooms are often lingered on, whether it's a character about to enter, or a character leaving. These spaces are where our drama takes place, and even though they're empty, the emotions still reverberate within them. The drama may have left, but the spaces endure. The meditative silent moments in a room are parallel to the peaceful glances out of a window. Parallels are seen throughout Ozu's subjects, as this is another way of providing equivalence across them. A connectivity between things gives them a degree of importance, and we can see this through Ozu's treatment of objects. Ozu sacrifices exact meanings for motifs focused around interpretation. This is just enough development of these complex motif connections to punctuate a purpose for the audience. Remember, this is real life Ozu wanted to capture. Ozu would typically close on a motif presented early on in the film. It's just to show the cycle of our lives. We've seen a snapshot of someone else's, but now ours must carry on. I once described City of God in a previous video essay as an open world film. 
And if that's the case, then Ozu made the exact opposite. I would never say that nothing happens in an Ozu film. There's a heavy reliance on normality, but all his films are emotionally intense. He's a director that makes us look at the parts of life that we have to endure. We need to understand the pain of letting go, but the importance of moving on. Ozu transcribed the details of human sadness, but displayed it through a craft that allows us to relate. His style managed to walk a line so narrow that it can't be taught. The best way to understand it is to feel it. A method of cinema that delivers to an audience, yet never intrudes in its worlds. The eye for symmetry, synchronicity of motion, fidelity of editing shows such an exacting detail that it all points to a filmmaker that wanted to say something. Ozu never saw himself as a master of his art. He compared himself more to a tofu maker, saying, I just want to make good tofu. Yasujiro Ozu just wanted to look at life, and his techniques may have been simple, but it's the depth of simplicity that shows us how beautiful a life can be.